Hello, and welcome to Maverick Dreamers and Thinkers. I'm Chloe Cho. In this digital era, turning data into gold has been the big conundrum facing most companies. From Google, Facebook to Amazon, those that manage to monetize data, however controversial their methods might be, have emerged as today's biggest tech giants. As the saying goes, the devil is in the detail, especially when it comes to capturing industry insights, trends, or innovation cycles through patents. Is it possible to grasp millions of patents worldwide? What do they tell us anyway? Let's connect the dots. If Dyson, the company famous for its high-end vacuum cleaners, files a patent for hair dryer technology, you can assume that it'll unveil some high-tech hair dryer as it did in the name of the Dyson Supersonic six years later. This tells us that if Apple has been filing dozens of patents related to electric car technology, bingo. Analysts see the iPhone maker launching the iCar sometime between 2023 and 2025. You have this amazing data set based on millions, hundreds of thousands of patents that are filed internationally. And you can see that there's a trend and you can actually have an edge or at least try to have some clairvoyance over what's happening in the world. Do you really see that? Yes, a lot of the patents that Apple filed, that Dyson filed, they won't tell it anywhere else other than just in patent data. So you can sort of, based on what they filed, you can foresee their product roadmap. You know what new product they might be coming out. That's why a lot of our customers use this patents data to find out the technology landscape, the competitor technology landscape, and know, okay, Apple is going to launch this and this potentially in the next 12 to 18 months or two years. So how we can then navigate this technology landscape and have our own innovation and do it in another way. Meet 36-year-old Jeffrey Tiong, founder and CEO of PatSnap, short for patents in a snap. PatSnap is an AI software platform that offers a comprehensive overview of international patents from licensing to litigation through its global database. With more than 800 staff across North America, Europe, and Asia, the Series C startup has raised more than $100 million. If we were to visualize the role of PatSnap from a Hollywood storyline, Jeffrey says PatSnap is essentially like the character Q in the James Bond movies that provides 007 with the -the state-of-the-art gadgets and devices he needs to get the job done. Knowledge is power and analytical intelligence is the only way Bond, James Bond, can outsmart and beat the bad guys. Innovation is the buzzword nowadays. You consider Pat Snap sort of like the Q character in the James Bond movie, right? The person that James Bond runs after when they need a gadget, when they need some super machine to wipe out the enemies. And you certainly found this amazing business model, this tool to monetize data. And this has been the million billion dollar question that so many people have been clamoring for. When I first started 13 years ago, I will not say I can see all this, but I definitely with the intention of how I can make full use of this very valuable data set called patterns data. Just to give some context, patterns system, how it works in essence, someone as an inventor, you file an invention pattern, the government give you 20 years of monopoly right. So that means if anyone use your invention, you can commercialize it, you can ask for money. In return, the government requires you as an inventor to disclose everything about your invention such that your knowledge can benefit the wider world. And that is the deal. That is the whole essence of patent system. And we have collected all 300 years of patents data since the first patent published in US Patent Office in the 17th century. We have all this, and this is a very valuable data source that now we are mining it 
and make it available to everyone like you and me to better understand a technology field, a new technology landscape. Your lightning moment, your aha moment came when you were on an exchange student program while studying at Singapore's and US, and you went over to Wharton in the US and you were working at a medical device company in Philadelphia and you were slugging away, yes. <laughs> taking care of all of their patents and it was probably not a fun job. But did you really see the potential? And did you really realize that, hey, if I actually turn it around into a business, this could become gold, a gold mine? I will say um, I definitely see the value of this pattern information. Back then, I want to make it as available to as many people as possible. I know that is very useful because that is the only data source in the world that have everything under the sun, all the invention you can think of. But in terms of the market size, everyone is talking about innovation. Even now, US-China trade war, one big part of it is about intellectual property. That I definitely didn't see it coming. But I do see the value and the power of if we can mine this patterns data set, it will be very useful. What has proven to be a winning idea didn't take off initially. Jeffrey, who hails from Sabah, Malaysia, launched PatSnap in a container garage 13 years ago in Singapore, straight out of university. After struggling to raise funds in the first year, he uprooted to China. There's a huge leap in terms of the advances that your company has made. You started out in a small room in Singapore <laughs> just after graduating from NUS. And then a year later, you decided to split and go to China. Yep. So from that small room in Singapore and then China and where you are today, there are many, many dots. So initially, what was the form, the business model that you were looking for? And how did it get to this analytical intelligence providing database of international patents. Yes, you'll be surprised actually PestNet business model didn't change. I actually still showed to my team just recently a few slides that I pitched to investor 13 years ago when I first started PestNet. That is still hold true. What I thought about the vision and what the business model is, essentially a subscription business that still hold true up until today. So that part somehow I nailed it from day one and didn't change. But definitely, yes, we have come a long way since uh, when I first started alone in a garage, literally a garage, a sea container in NUS. I slept in the office to save money. And yes, the next year we venture out to China and that was also, I would say, one of the most critical decisions I have made. And that is a key inflection point for PestNet because of our presence in China since 2008 there. I think this is one of the fastest growing market for us and one of the most exciting market for us as well. Was it difficult to venture into China? Yes, you are Malaysian Chinese, so you might have spoken Mandarin. But from somebody from Southeast Asia, China is a whole different ballgame. I will say after all these years living there, stay there, working with my very hardworking, good work ethic Chinese colleague, Yes, I would say China is a very, very different market. So even though now PestNet, we have strong market presence in both East and West, in China and US, the world two largest market. But the way we deploy our sales force, the go-to market is entirely different. The way they work in China is very different. And US eventually gave you some startup money. It was too small. And when you had to really hustle and you weren't getting any traction in Singapore, you decided to jump ship and go to China. What was that process like? Oh, that was definitely tough. That part definitely is one of the down part in my life or in my career so far. So when I first started, I tried to pitch to many investors and got rejected. Before that, I went to US on this entrepreneurship internship program and I managed to participate in the Wharton Business Plan Competition and went into the final. I got featured here in the business, the local business time. I got awarded the Young Students Entrepreneur Award by NUS. And with that kind of context, actually I thought, hey, if I come back with this, 
I should be able to easily pitch to some investor and get half a million started from garage, just like a lot of kids what they do from Stanford, from Harvard. But of course, the truth is so different. So in 2007, when I first started, it was also about the financial crisis. And back then in Singapore, the VC environment wasn't established as well. There wasn't any angel investor or VC. So I went around, pitched to many investors. I got rejected many times. Why do you think you got so heavily rejected? Is it simply that the VCs didn't get it? Because obviously you have a business model that's remained more or less the same. Is it about the timing and the environment that you're surrounded with? Both. I truly think both make a big difference. Back then in Singapore, investing in a not proven entrepreneur without any track record, that is not common. And secondly, the timing wise, what we do now, even as of today, is still a relatively new field. And we are in a B2B software as a service. Back then, B2B really unheard of, even in the West. So when we told them about this business, not that many people understand our business model. In hindsight, relocating to Suzhou in 2008 was a move that had foresight, as China would go on to lead a geographical shift of innovation from west to east. Asia-based innovators filed more than half of all international patent applications through the World Intellectual Property Organization, or WIPO, for the first time in 2018. The fastest pace of growth in innovation was driven by China, followed by India and South Korea. If current trends continue, China could overtake the United States in patent filings within a year or two. Given the dynamic landscape, PatSnap has a client base of more than 8,000 around the world from industry leaders such as NASA, Tesla, Spotify, Heineken, and Warner Brothers to startups. Your clients are all over the world. Is the data that you share, is the intelligence that you share the same? Whether it's a company A that is very small, a startup, versus a gigantic beast, a Fortune 500 company, for example. Yes. So all our users, be it from startup to a research institute to a large multinational company, they access the same platform. And our platform will present the analytics in the way they want. They can slice and dice the analytics. That is also where our expertise came in. We designed the software and behind the scene, we actually did a lot of data countering, data cleanup. When user type in any query, like I want to know about blockchain, everything about blockchain or everything about AI in China, we can then present this data, this insight to the user. And what are some of your insightful findings when you look at your own platform with regards to AI, with regards to blockchain. There was this hype over whether it was going to be the next big thing taking over the world of finance. And you notice how cryptocurrencies, which are the byproduct of blockchain, they're just getting sold off in this fear and panic of the coronavirus. Recently, I just did a webinar organized by EY talking about AI. Yes, it's interesting. We find that Asia and particular China, they have been following a lot of patterns on AI. Their growth rate is much higher than the rest of the world. We did observe an increase in blockchain-related patterns following even three, four years ago. But as far as I know, we don't see any really good mainstream application using blockchain yet, but using blockchain for security, for a lot of fintech, financial industry, I think it start picking up. How does the whole process work? Let's say I invented something creative. I want to file a patent. How does one go about it? Let's say we're in Singapore, I do it through Singapore and then Asia, and then does it become international? Or you do it just at one go, it becomes all over the world by jurisdiction. So every country run their own patent office. So if you file in Singapore, and if Singapore government patent office granted you the patent, it only works in Singapore. If you want to go file in US or China, you have to file separately. But currently in the world, there are two organizations that help you sort of consolidate the filing a little bit, but you still have to get approved by each country. So one is WIPO, the other one is European Pattern Organization. So these are the two kind of mechanisms that if you file through them, you can get to many countries, 
but the approval right still lies on each country. Is it possible to have a global patent? No, there isn't such thing as global patent. If you develop a technology, it takes time, five months, six months, and then somebody hears about it, yes. and they copycat your patent, and then they go file it in Bermuda. Yes. You can't stop them. For an examiner to grant you a patent, they need to make sure your invention is new and novel under the sun. That means anywhere else. So you started in Singapore, in Bermuda, let's say the examiner found that, hey, there's another guy in Singapore has already done that, then they won't approve your patent. Oh, it's a fair game. That is the whole essence of it. Of course, sometimes they might miss it. And is it costly as you go from country to country? Because ideally, right, if you have something amazing, phenomenal, as you go through from country A to Z, if so, are we talking in the range of hundreds of thousands or does it go up to millions? Yes. Fouling patterns is a commercial decision. So yes, it protects your asset, your invention, but it is also very much a business decision. Typically, to get a patent approved in US and all the other major country with big market, I would say usually go up to about 100,000 per patent. And this is just a fouling. After you foul it every year after or every other year, you still have to pay a maintenance fee to maintain your patents. And as the year goes by to, let's say, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, the payment you have to make is higher. Some companies, they can file many patents, but after year three, year five, they didn't maintain it. They let it lapse. Mm. That means those patents are not so commercially good or viable. Mm. So we have software to help analyze what patents the company file and which one they keep maintaining it. And the more countries they maintain, the more expensive it is. So that's why this is one way to identify a company commercial strategy through their patent filing. Oh, that's so very insightful. An insightful read into what's happening in the world of technology, in the world of innovation. It's a startup and you believe that you have a phenomenal technology and you want to file this patent internationally. You may go bankrupt while you're filing for that. That's why companies, even from startups, need tools like us. We essentially help give them a roadmap to help detect the competitors already file patents in this area. So what else you can do to protect or advance your innovation, your commercial strategy and help them to really spend where the money is needed. But that's definitely is a huge cost. You have to be well thought out. You are a biomedical engineer and today you're running a sprawling international business. What did it take to rewire your mindset, your thought process from that of an engineer to a boss, to an entrepreneur? Yes, and this is a good question. So when I first started PestNet, yes, I view myself more an engineer, a product manager, because I like to design a product that solves problem and hopefully as many people use this product as much as possible. But over the years, I slowly find that designing an organization Developing an organization is just like an engineer problem. Seeing it, designing an organization that lasts hopefully as long as possible and the kind of culture we can build in, this is also to me a product design problem. So I guess there is some similarity there. When you were a startup entrepreneur in the early days, you know, trying to expand in China, trying to grow the business, I guess you needed to have a lot of grit, sweat and perseverance. But now that the business is on a far higher level, already Series C funding, more than $100 million of investments pouring into the company, it's about managerial oversight. What do you do today that you didn't do before when you were a startup guy just running around trying to plug holes here and there? Oh, something I wish I could do earlier as well, yeah. In fact, my management team, about 10 plus of us, we came from seven and eight nationalities. We are very international team, very diverse presence across the globe. And I would say as we reaching this size, Every stage has its own challenge. At this stage currently, what I'm working on since this year, so my personal goal for this year as well, is how do I ensure this 800 people workforce around the world with such a diverse culture and we keep everyone aligned on the vision and mission of PestNet. Because only when everyone align on the same vision, values and culture, then only we can continue charging ahead as one team. 
In these times of supercharged growth, Jeffrey has been traveling feverishly back and forth from North America, Asia to Europe every week, merely spending weekends at home with his growing family of three small children. The coronavirus is keeping him grounded for now in Singapore, where PatSnap keeps its R&D center, as he resorts to video conferencing and conference calls. Although the virus scare has complicated the way work is done across different offices of PatSnap, Jeffrey is sanguine about the outlook ahead. How are you doing today? Good. <laughs> Overall, I think definitely the world is going through an unprecedented event, like three to four times consecutively the market crash in U.S. But overall, I see that as an opportunity from an entrepreneur point of view. Pat snap. Patents in a snap. It seems like it's such a weatherproof business model, whether it's the coronavirus. It's all about something that is digital, right? It's about having that analytical perspective of the patents market internationally. So what stresses you? What could possibly stress you given that you've had this phenomenal growth over the past decade? I would say patents, intellectual property came from R&D investment. And it's indeed true, I would say, since Second World War up until now, even the last financial crisis in 2007, 2008, R&D investment has never decreased. It's always on the growth trajectory, it's just by how much. In good time, bad time, companies will continue to invest in R&D because investing in R&D is investing in the future. Do you sometimes think about stepping aside, running an international business as sexy and glamorous as it sounds is just pure heartache and headache. So I've seen a lot of people take on like the chief visionary officer, the chairman type role, and then they just hire a professional CEO to step in so that you can actually have a life, you know, you can actually spend some time with your wife and three kids. Do you see that happening or are you too young for that? Yes, I have been thinking, reflecting on this question every year. Why do I still want to keep doing this? It's very intense. Like for me nowadays, even though I'm in Singapore these few months due to the coronavirus, I woke up at 8 and start having call with my China team. Late noon, I start having call with London. My last meeting every day now until 11.30 p.m. with my Toronto team. My character, like I have done a MBTI, Meyer Briggs character test before. I belong to the group called The Adventurer. I'm curious. I always like to know what is out there. If I were born a few hundred years ago, I definitely will be on a sea voyages with Columbus, like find out what is out there. And that really is what keeps pushing me. I would like to know how is it like running, for example, a public listed company? How is it like to do some m and I would like to keep exploring the world. Plus what we do here, helping the innovators around the world to innovate better. That is a very interesting problem to solve as well. I would say me and my team, we are still relatively young. We are mid-30s. So I guess we still have a long way to go. Doing an IPO on Wall Street, if that's your goal, when you look at the market mayhem due to fears gripping global stock markets, do you have second thoughts? No. I mean, this will pass. I mean, in the big scheme of things, this will pass. I believe in our market, as we mentioned that R&D, during good time, bad time, people still invest in R&D. And we are doing this for the long haul. I'm thinking of it another 10 years, 20 years. So if you're the conquistador, you're the guy on the vessel <laughs> voyaging across the seas to the Americas, to Europe and wherever, I guess and you'd be looking at M&A targets because you have competitors nipping at your heels right now. And it's all about scale. Yes, yes. Internally, we do keep track of startups that are coming out that are similar in our space across Europe, Germany, China, and US. We do keep tap on them. And hopefully when time is right, we can do something more, explore partnership with them as well. Having built PatSnap into the dominant market leader over the past decade with an adventurous spirit, the curious entrepreneur is far from done in exploring new frontiers in business as he's keen on building a vision and leaving a lasting legacy. You have a very cosmopolitan life. It's hectic and crazy. Psychologically and mentally, it's thousands and thousands of miles away from where you grew up, Saba, 
on Kota Kinabalu, a beautiful resort island of Malaysia. Did you ever imagine that your life would get so heavily transported? To be frank, yeah, I never thought so. I grew up in a very chill, relaxing tourism city with just half a million population. Never have thought of doing what I'm doing now. Very different. A lot of accolades have poured in in the past several years as Patsnap became the market leader. One of which was being awarded the EY Entrepreneur of the Year award, and then you got to go to Monte Carlo. Do you feel like you can stop and you've kind of achieved it? Yeah, quite a lot of people ask me that question. Somehow, I don't think so at all. Maybe the goal that I set is so. Far higher up. What is that goal? I mean, what more do you want? Yes, that that is a good question. That is the question I ask myself every year as well. I will say I started Pestnet not because of money, not because of all these accolades. My philosophy is you live life once. I would like to maximize it. I would like to know where is my potential, where is my limit. That's why I would like to keep pushing my own boundary to know how far. Can I go? What else can I do? And how much more impact can I make to this world? As Jeffrey envisions the next decade, he's contemplating relocating his family from Singapore to one of Pat Snap's main locations, be it Toronto, Canada, or Shanghai, China, to reduce his frequent traveling. After an era of spirited expansion that saw Pat Snap go from a one-man operation to a thriving international business. Jeffrey says one thing that he's learned over the years is the importance of reinventing himself at every stage of growth. What lesson? What advice would you have for other entrepreneurs? The mindset I think needs to change from when you're a startup guy to when you're running a sprawling business. My role models are people like Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos, Michael Dell. You know, all these people I can't imagine they have to reinvent themselves. Many many times throughout their own personal journey, their personal growth, managing our 800 people compared to when I first started myself, I think I have to reinvent myself multiple times. What works at one stage, it definitely doesn't work for the next stage. I have to change. I think one key mindset everyone should have is、um, I call the growth mindset. As long as you have the growth mindset, you believe that you can learn and you keep learning, you will get there. Because a lot of things intellectually, I don't think is so difficult. We are not building rocket science like Elon Musk. Feeling to change yourself, that is easier said than done. Because to change yourself, you to change your habits that you had over the years is not easy. I think is that also then boils down to how hungry you are, how much you want to make it work. There's a lot of doom and gloom out there. Yet, did you realize that guys like Jeff Bezos at Amazon, they're hiring a hundred thousand people? Yes, exactly. That's why I see from an entrepreneur point of view, I see this an opportunity. Like famously quoted by Warren Buffett, "When everyone is greedy, be fearful. When everyone is fearful, be greedy." To me, I see this is an opportunity. If we do it right, what are your goals for this year? So many challenges internally, and many things we have to do better. There's also a personal goal I set for myself earlier this year. I would like Pestnet as a 800 plus people organization around the world. I would like us to have a very strong vision. If we can do that, if I can align everyone from a new hire to our leadership team, I think the opportunity is 15 grabs. We can execute. Well, to capture this opportunity. That's Jeffrey Tiong, founder and CEO of Patsnap, as he continues his entrepreneurial voyage around the world. Hope you enjoyed this candid perspective. Thank you so much for tuning in. Do share this podcast with a friend and give us a quick review. Join us next week on Maverick Dreamers and Thinkers as we explore the risk of cyber attacks while remote working. Cyber feminist and cybersecurity expert Magda Chelly joins us. Stay tuned, and if you're on social media, reach out to me. Let me know what you think of the podcast. I'm Chloe Cho. Never stop dreaming. <laughs>